so much, um, Kristen, Dr. Sokol. Thanks for joining. So of just to everyone that we're going to be talking about chronic spontaneous urticaria. And um, before we get started, just wanted to say that this session was developed in partnership with Vindical Medical Education with an educational grant supported by Genentech and a member of the Roche Group and Sanofi and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. So, um, Kristen, thanks so much for being here today. Um, can you do a quick call for everyone? Yeah. So, hi. Thank you so much, Pyle. Um, and thank you to Vindico. So, my name is Dr. Kristen Sokol. I am an allergist immunologist in the D.C. area. And like Dr. Gupta, I see patients with chronic spontaneous urticaria every day, all the time. Um, I see lots of other allergic conditions, too. But chronic spontaneous urticaria is near and dear to my heart. Um, I really love treating it. Yeah, absolutely. I was saying that right before you came on, too, that it's a condition that it feels so good to treat and to help patients feel better because they're really suffering. And if they've been in that cycle of urgent care, it's just nice to help them, right? Definitely. Um, so we have some questions that we're going to answer uh, today. So what should a patient expect when visiting an allergist to talk about potential treatments for chronic spontaneous urticaria? Yeah, great question. So I think the first thing we need to know is if the patient definitely has chronic spontaneous urticaria, right? So chronic, well, acute and chronic urticaria can show up, but not be diagnosed as CSU. So we really need to um, diagnose them correctly, make sure there's nothing else going on. And so when a patient visits, I want to know their history. I want to know exactly what's been going on, who they've seen for this condition, what medications they've tried, what has been prescribed. Um, also bring pictures. So pictures are worth a thousand words. So if I can see pictures of those hives or those angioedema episodes, those swelling episodes, that will really help me to narrow down the diagnosis. Um, and so once a patient has been diagnosed with chronic spontaneous urticaria, um, I also want to know kind of about just their quality of life, right? Like, how is this affecting them? Because I think that there are different patients, different patient profiles that we see with this condition, and they really span a large kind of group. Um, so I can see patients that are very comfortable, and they might get hives, but they don't really bother them. And then I see, you know, the complete opposite spectrum where they are just miserable, right? They're not, be, they're not able to go to work. They're not able to take care of their children. They're not able to sleep. So I really want to know that information and some patients might be hesitant to share that with me but that's really important for the diagnosis and for moving forward with treatment absolutely we want to know how much they're suffering and we want to know what they've tried and things that haven't worked and have worked for them right. so it's really Definitely. important to come in with all of that information and yes to pictures and videos right we want to see it all because whenever they come to our office they don't have any of it they're all of a sudden everything's gone they're completely clear so i absolutely agree and then we also want to talk about why are we a good choice why are allergists a good choice for someone who's concerned with chronic spontaneous urticaria I know it's kind of strange because we always tell these chronic spontaneous urticaria patients, these CSU patients, that they're not allergic to anything, right? But we are the ones that treat and treat and care for this condition. Um, we're just well trained in it. We, you know, we've seen it ever since our residencies and fellowships that 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 specialized in allergy and immunology. Um, it's kind of likened to an autoimmune disorder, but the autoimmune doctors don't see this. We do. Um, so why that is, I'm not really sure, but. They, we, you know, we see these patients all the time. Um, we use medicines that treat allergic conditions for CSU. Um, so we know a lot about the medications. We know a lot about the side effects or the adverse effects of these medications. And we know how to counsel our patients when they're taking these medications. Um, a dermatologist is another doctor that sometimes takes care of CSU. And a lot of times the dermatologist and I will work together. Um, or the dermatologist will say, you know what, I'm just going to refer to the allergist because I'm not comfortable taking care of this condition. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think we're also good at differentiating, right, between is it an allergic cause of urticaria or hives or is it this chronic spontaneous urticaria, which really doesn't have a rhyme or reason. Right. right. Um, and so the next thing is in high dose and if, if high dose antihistamines, which are the allergy pills that most people have tried for their urticaria, don't work for somebody with chronic spontaneous urticaria, what is our next step? 
really the mainstay of treatment of chronic spontaneous urticaria is starting with antihistamines, just the over-the-counter ones. So these include brand name things like Zyrtec, Allegra, Zizol, and often we need increased doses of these medications to treat hives. So the box or the bottle might say once a day, last 24 hours, but we really go above that dose and that is safe to do. So we need to reassure our patients that that is a safe approach to this condition. Um, once a patient has hit this high doses of chronic or of of antihistamines um, and they're just not working, right? They're still itchy, they're still miserable, they're still getting wheels and swelling all the time. There are FDA approved medications now for this condition, which is great. There are two um, on the market. One has been approved for quite a while, it's called Zolaire. And then one is more recently approved for this condition specifically and that's called Dupixent. They work in a little bit of a different ways, um, but both are great medications to move forward with if we're not doing well on antihistamines or if we're not able to tolerate antihistamines, which is a problem for some patients. Um, so we have these two medications to choose from, and that's kind of the next step after trying high-dose antihistamines. And allergists are very comfortable with both of these medications. We use them for additional conditions, um, all the time. So we have experience with these medications, we have long-term safety data on these medications, and so we are very comfortable. Um, these medications work very well in many patients, but not all. Thank you, Kristen. And, um, and you know, you talked, uh, you did talk about Zolaire or omalizumab and Dupixent or Dupilumab. So I guess that we've gone through that and can you just like talk a little bit more about so there are injectable medications um, and the difference between like maybe how they're dosed? Do you want to get into that or is that a nuance that? Well, I'm I'm sure some patients want to hear about that. Um, so for Zolaire, it is um, a, a once a month medication. It's an injectable medication. And um, the first couple doses are given in an allergist or other healthcare provider's office. There is a very, very rare side effect of actually having an allergic reaction to this medication. It is so rare. I mean, I've been tra treating this condition and other allergic conditions with Zolaire for 20 plus years, and I've maybe seen a side effect like that a couple of times, less than one hand. Um, yeah. And so, but because the, you know, there is that warning, there is um, the side of the potential side effect of an allergic reaction to the drug, we do, uh, we do, will we will give the first three doses in our office and we wait for a, one full hour after the dose to make sure that you're the patient is doing well. Um, after that, it's usually given once a month, either at home or back in the office or someone who's comfortable giving it to the patient. Um, the Dupixin is, is similar. Um, it's a similar drug, um, just works in a little bit of a different way, um, but we're seeing really good results with that. Um, so yeah, if you have any other specific questions about those. That was perfect. I just wanted to give people a little bit of an overview. And then um, now let's shift gears and talk about quality of life. So quality of life is such an issue for our CSU patients. What should we as doctors do to address the quality of life part of the CSU journey? Yeah, I mean, I think that, like we said, allergists are really good at identifying um, and treating and diagnosing chronic spontaneous urticaria, and I think we're good at it because we do focus on the quality of life issues. We have specific questionnaires, patient-centered questionnaires that we can give that specifically go through questions like, you know, how how many hours are you sleeping a night? How is your itch on a scale from one to 10? Um, are you, how many days of work have you missed? How many days of school have you missed? These kind of questions um, that I think are, are often overlooked by some other doctors that aren't, it's not because they're bad doctors, right? They're just not trained in diagnosing and caring for this condition. Um, also knowing that information about their quality of life can kind of lead us to the right treatment, right? So like I said in the beginning of this talk, if a patient is, you know, not really bothered by their hives other than maybe once or once a month, right? They have a flare that really bothers them. They might not need to be on every uh, something every day. Whereas a physician or another healthcare provider who doesn't listen to that, right, might just say, oh, take these medicines every day, right? And we don't want to over treat, right? So we want to we want to hit that patient with the right medications at the right time with the right dose um, and really individualize their care. Absolutely. And I think that for patients just 
as far as the quality of life issue is concerned, we care, right? We really understand that CSU, we have so much data to show that this really affects people, like you said, their sleep, their work-life balance, even interpersonal relationships are really affected by a condition like chronic spontaneous urticaria because it's spontaneous, right? It can appear at any time. There's no rhyme or reason for it. So you might have this lovely date planned and all of a sudden you're miserable and you can't do it, right? And this other person has planned this amazing night for you and you're just not able to go. And that really can lead to a lot of friction um, in relationships. And we've heard that over and over again in like patient groups and from um, surveys that have gone out to CSU patients. So it's just really important for you to let us know those things because it really helps us guide how um, aggressive we can be with treatment, right? Yeah. And so, um, so we do actually have a question. Um, so if antihistamines aren't working, how do you decide which medication to try first? Great question. Um, so I want to rewind just by making sure that the patient is on the, the right antihistamines and they're on a high dose before I try to move to a biologic injectable medicine. So I always have that conversation first with the patient. And, you know, when we're prescribing or, or recommending these antihistamines, I often will follow up with the patient very quickly after, right? So that's really important. I'm not saying go try an antihistamine and take it at a high dose and then I'll see you in six months. No, I want to see this patient soon after, maybe within a couple weeks even, because I want to know if that antihistamine is working or not. And if it's not, we can move very quickly to one of these other approved biologic medications. Um, traditionally, you know, up until recently, we really only had one. So there wasn't really a choice, right? We went right to Zolaire. Um, if, and if, if a patient has failed Zolaire, we increase the dose of Zolaire um, or we decrease the frequency between the doses of Zolaire. So there's a little bit of wiggle room with the Zolaire. Now that there's another option, um, you know, we have this discussion with the patients, shared decision making, right? So we can talk to the patients about these two options. We can tell them different um, side effects, really, if, you know, there's not many, but we can tell them about the side effects. We can tell them the mechanism of how these drugs work, what other conditions they're used for, right, which is really important. So in one of my other sessions, someone asked, or I was asked, you know, is this more common in patients with other allergic conditions. And we can certainly see CSU patients without anything else, right, without any other allergic conditions, but we do see a ton of patients with other allergic conditions. So that's that we can take into account when deciding which medication to use. Um, Dupixin is a very, very popular biologic medicine for eczema. So if a patient has eczema and then they, you know, have now, they've been diagnosed with chronic spontaneous urticaria, that would be the first medicine I would choose. Um, if they have allergic asthma, right, then Zolaire would be the first medicine I can choose. So it's always good to have options. Um, and I think that kind of leads us into our last topic, Dr. Gupta, which is, is there anything on the horizon? And there is. Um, so more options, the better for chronic urticaria, especially since we haven't had anything new for a really, really, really long time in this condition. Um, so there is an oral, an oral option coming on the market, hopefully within the next few months. Um, that is a twice a day oral medication that works in a completely different way than antihistamines. Um, it is a, will be a prescription only medication. And then there's lots of research being done into more oral and injectable medications that um, that work in different ways to treat the patients that maybe are totally biologic naive, they've never tried anything, but also the ones that have failed the prior biologics or the prior medications that are already on the market and approved. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm so excited. I mean, in general, in our field, um, we have so much growth, right? And it's just so exciting because if a patient doesn't respond to one medication, as you said, then we have options, right? We can transition them to something else. And in the past, we haven't had that. And so that's felt so frustrating and restricting. So it's just nice to be able to have these conversations with patients and actually give them choices. Thank you so much. Um, I think chronic spontaneous urticaria is, um, I would say it's a hot topic right now because um, I feel like it's becoming more and more common for people to suffer from um, urticaria. And also just for everyone listening, there are resources for patients with chronic urticaria, right? So we should direct those um, 
our patients there. Um, anyone who thinks they might have chronic spontaneous urticaria or who've been diagnosed with chronic spontaneous urticaria, there's the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. They have a section for patients on this condition. The American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology has a section. Um, the, uh, the ITCH podcast, obviously, Dr. Gupta, you talk about chronic spontaneous urticaria a lot. Um, there is a new website um, called Never Just Hives um, that is very patient focused. They have a lot of videos and resources online for patients. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Is there anything to add there? I think those are good. Yeah, reasons. I mean, I also like the Allergy and Asthma Network. I think they do a yes, great job. Yes. And they have whole sections on urticaria also, and they're very patient focused. Yes. So um, yeah, there is just so much great information out there. So you're not alone. There is a community, there are doctors that care, and there's other patients that you can reach out to too that can also help guide the way. So there's, um, you're never alone in this condition or in any chronic condition. So that's really the message too. But thank you, Kristen, this was super fun. Thanks, yeah. have a good, a good night. night. Okay, All right. bye. bye.